a while ago I did a video on some of the different uh, Commodore 64 kernel uh, variations and revisions. And in that video I show off some of the more unusual variations of the Commodore 64 kernel. So, but in today's video, I want to sort of take a bit of a closer look at some of those more unusual variations of the Commodore 64 kernel. So let's get right into it. So this first ROM variation we're going to look at is the one that came with the Commodore SX64, which was basically the portable version of the Commodore 64. The first thing you'll notice right off the bat is that the colors are different. They're actually the same colors as the VIC-20, and Commodore decided to use different colors for the SX64 to make it easier to read on the tiny little screen. The second thing you'll probably notice is that the startup message is different. It says SX64 Basic instead of Commodore 64 Basic. And the third difference is if we go to load something from cassette by just typing load or load followed by a file name, it'll give us an illegal device number error. And that's because the Commodore SX64 did away with the cassette port, so you can't connect a data set to the SX64. And they decided since they did away with the cassette port on the hardware side, so they decided may as well remove that functionality from the ROM too. Before I move on to our next ROM, I'd like to clarify the difference between the Commodore PET 64 and the Commodore Educator 64. People often use these two names interchangeably, and I can see why, since they're both more or less identical. Both of these machines were machines released by Commodore for use in computer labs and stuff. They're basically a Commodore 64 inside of a PET case. They did this because the Commodore 64 was easily broken and easily stolen, whereas the Commodore PET was built like a tank and much more suitable for use in a computer lab environment. Unfortunately, these machines didn't really take off, and they're not very common these days. But anyway, there is actually a difference between the Pet 64 and the Educator 64. I don't know why there's two different versions, but the Educator 64 uses the regular old Commodore 64 ROM, probably ROM 2, judging by when it came out in 1983, whereas the Pet 64, sometimes also called the CBM 4064, has its own custom ROM, which is what I'm going to be showing you today. Okay, so here it is. First thing I probably notice is that instead of saying Commodore 64 Basic Version 2, it says Commodore 4064 Basic Version 2. And this is to align with the Commodore PET numbering scheme, where the first two digits are whether it's a 40 or 80 column machine, and the second two digits is how much RAM it has. Not all Commodore PETs follow that numbering scheme, but the 4000 and 8000 series do, and 4064 makes sense for the Commodore PET 64 since it's a 40 column machine. 64k of RAM. It also doesn't show how much RAM is free. Normally on a Commodore 64, it would say like 64k RAM system, 38,911 bytes free, but it doesn't say that here. And something kind of odd about this ROM variation is that if you go to like poke 53281 or 53280 to control the color of the border, it won't let you. Well, it will let you, and it'll f briefly flash that color, but then it'll go back to black again. That's because this ROM variation has a routine in the IRQ, so that every time the IRQ happens, those registers are set to zero again. This is a little machine language program that cycles through all the different colors for the border. As you can see, there's this black bar scrolling up the screen, and that's happening every time the IRQ is happening. And it's setting those registers back to zero. And this doesn't just apply to the border and background color, this also applies to sprites. So here's a little program here that'll display a sprite on the screen. And if I run it here, it should display a sprite on the screen. And it should be white as you can see by line 30 which sets the sprite color. Well, it also decides to set all the sprites to black. If you look sort of to in the right towards the middle of the screen, you actually sort of see where the sprite is because I had the priority set to in front of the text. But what if we want to change the color of the border or the sprites? Well, well, we can actually disable this little routine by setting the uppermost bit at memory location 646 to high. Memory location 646 is what controls the cursor color, and for that they only need the lower nibble or the lower 4 bits. And on the PET64, the uppermost bit is used to turn the uh, screen blackening routine on and off. So I poke 646 with 128, which is a 1 followed by 7 zeros, that should turn off this routine. We also still need to set the cursor color, so we will add color code for whatever color we want to make the cursor. I just want to keep it white so I'll add 1 which will give us 129 and uh, yeah we can now change the color of the background and the border as well as our sprite. 
And as for why the Pet64 has this behavior, I sort of know why they did it for the uh, border and background colors because keep in mind that the Pet64 only had a monochrome like green screen and some programs might have been made for a color screen and the colors may have looked good on a color screen but not looked very good and made the text hard to read on a monochrome screen so that's probably why they did that and that definitely makes sense as for why they did the same thing to the sprite colors i don't know it doesn't really make any sense to me but anyway i'm glad they included a way to turn it off so the next rom variation we're going to be looking at is the japanese commodore 64 rom this one's probably the most interesting there are three things that are different from the regular Commodore 64 ROM here. See if you can spot all three. The first one is that the colors are the same as the VIC-20, and the font is actually different. On the Commodore 64, the font is two pixels wide, whereas on the PET and VIC-20, the font is one pixel wide. They made the font two pixels wide on the C64 to make it easier to read on like televisions connected over RF, since that can be pretty fuzzy. And a lot of people did use TVs as monitors back in the day, even though the picture wasn't great. So they used a two pixel wide font so it would be easier to read. Uh, a lot of people did use TVs as monitors with their VIC-20s too, but since the text is so big and chunky on the VIC-20, it's not really a big deal. And there's also no lowercase characters in the character set on this ROM. So here's the character set when I print out all the characters. And if I press Shift Commodore to switch to the second character set, as you can see, there's no lowercase characters, but instead a bunch of the graphics characters are switched out for uh, Japanese characters. And this also brings us to why it uses a single pixel wide font. Some of the Japanese characters are just too detailed, and if you were to have two pixels wide, it would be too thick. You wouldn't be able to fit all the detail required for those characters, so, so they had to make the Japanese characters a single pixel wide, and they did that to all the characters just for consistency. So yeah, there, there's no lowercase characters on this ROM variation. The third and final thing I want to talk about about the Japanese C64 is those of you with a keen eye earlier on probably noticed that instead of saying 38,911 bytes free when you start the C64, here it says 36,863 bytes, so there's approximately two less kilobytes free to basic. Why is that? Okay, so here I am on a regular C64. And I'm going to load up Jim Butterfield's Super Mon 64. This is a machine language monitor. And one thing about this is it has this little thing that runs in basic first before it launches the monitor. And the monitor is written in machine language. But there's this little basic part. And uh, yeah, let's go into the monitor. One of the things that this program allows us to do is it allows us to view the contents of memory. So if we look at memory location 0800 hex, as you can see, there's our, where our basic program is being stored. You can see the Supermon 64, Jim Butterfield, yada yada yada. Same thing that's in our basic program. And here it is stored in memory at 0800. Okay, so let's load up the same monitor on the Japanese Commodore 64 and look at memory location 0800. And uh, looks like there's nothing there because there isn't anything there. Just a bunch of zeros and 255s, which is what's there when you power up the C64, that's just the way it's initialized. VIC-20 similarities don't stop at colors and font. So let's look at 1000 hex, which is where basic starts on the VIC-20. And there's our code. So basic actually starts at 1000 hex on the Japanese Commodore 64. I have no idea why this is that way. And since it's a higher up memory location, you do lose two kilobytes. So anyway, I, I have no idea why this is that way, but that's the way it is. If you're interested in learning more about the machine language monitor, uh, I did a video on it a few months back, which I'll have linked at the end of this video. Okay, so the final ROM variation we're going to look at today is the Commodore 64 GS ROM. This one's probably the most unusual and unusable. The Commodore 64 GS or Commodore 64 game system was a system released by Commodore in 1990. It was uh, not very well thought out. It was just like a Commodore 64 but with no keyboard, and it was basically just meant to play like cartridge games. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty big flop since it couldn't really run much C64 software, because even some cartridge games required you to press a key, even though they could be controlled with the joystick, they would ask like, you know, one or two players, or you know, press F1 to start or whatever. So yeah, it was a pretty big flop. And when we started up, we get this little animation telling you to turn it off before you put a cartridge in it. There's no basic prompt, but I did figure out a way to access the basic prompt on this machine. This does still include basic for compatibility reasons. There could be some cartridge games which use basic routines, 
So in order to get a basic prompt, I'm going to be using the final cartridge 3. There might be other utility cartridges that will let you do a similar thing, but the way I figured to do this with the final cartridge 3, and we boot up with the final cartridge 3, we get this little graphical user interface. And we can use the joystick to control the little pointer around, and there are a number of things we can do in here. Like there's, we can change some preferences, there's some disk utilities, there's even like a little notepad word processor type thing built in. But anyway, one of the things we can do from the final cartridge 3 is we can go to system, and then we can enter basic from the final cartridge 3. And there we go. We are now in basic. Obviously we can't type anything because there's no keyboard, but that's just a way you can get to the basic prompt if you so desire. You know, there's no real reason to since you can't type anything in. So anyway, that's just about it for today's video. I did another video on different Commodore 64 ROM versions, and in that video I, I covered some of the different uh, kernel revisions for just like, the regular C64 and some of the bugs and quirks of those, as well as I like, briefly touched on some of the ones that I touched on today. So uh, go check those out if you want. Again, I'll have it link linked at the end of the video. And uh, yeah, that's just about it for today's video. So uh, thanks for watching and have a great day.